All right. So today we have Carson Porter on with us. We are going to be talking about um, Rev, the agency syndicate that Carson runs and how he can help agents and how I've actually seen him help many agents um, over the last several months that I've been part of his group. Um, several agents that were close to me that I knew that were struggling who are having a completely different result in their agencies today. And that really inspired me to get Carson on and talk to him about what he's doing, because at the end of the day, this industry is difficult and it's getting even more difficult uh, as regulations and everything's change um, ongoing. And I know Carson has really stepped up to help agents share um, you know, what he has learned to build a successful agency and teach them so many skills that aren't being talked about in today's market. So um, Carson, thanks for being on with us today. I am excited to talk to you and you know, nine years in the agency uh, world, insurance world. Tell us about how you kind of got into it and uh, and what you've done so far. Yeah, I kind of fell into insurance, actually. I was, um, my wife and I were getting ready to start a family. And the time I was doing automotive repair, I had owned a couple shops and, and done well with those. I was making good money, um, all things considered, but it's also working uh, on a light week, like 80, 85 hours, some weeks, hundred plus hours. Um, and that's just what it took to, uh, to run our shops at the time. And I wanted, I never really had a, a close relationship with my father and I wanted to, Hey, if we're going to have kids, I want to at least be there for dinner or something, you know? And so it got me looking, um, <clears throat> at the same time, getting ready for, for kids. Uh, my wife was pregnant. We were trying to get our bills under control. So one of the things we were looking at was quoting out our insurance. And uh, I asked one of my friends who, who um, really good dude, hey, who do you use? And we got referred over. Well, um, we got referred to an American national agent in Southern Utah. Um, good dude. And he did end up saving us a bunch of money. Anybody in the property casualty game knows that's a crap shoot. It could have gone the other way, but he did. And it was helpful at the time. Uh, he was also a... Um, I guess you would call assistant manager, recruiter in the area. And he asked, Hey, you know, you're halfway pleasant to talk to. Have you ever thought about a career in insurance? And, um, you know, I had taken working hundred hour weeks. I'd taken uh, an hour to go over to his office across town, covered in grease, met my wife up there. She's sexy as hell and just looks good. Right. And so I'm already kind of in a bad mood. And, and then he's hitting on me for that. And I'm like, nah, dude, just, whatever, shut the hell up, brushed him off. Um, but then it just kind of ate at me as I continued looking for what's a different, I, I'm young, I'm dumb. What's a different career I could look at. And it kind of popped back in my mind. So I picked the phone and called him. I was like, Robert, you know, you said that you had a career opportunity in insurance. Come to find out everybody has a career opportunity in insurance. Right. <laughs> but, um, but I was like, were you, uh, were you bullshitting me or, or were you for real? And that's literally how I said it to him. He's like, no, I'm for real. I was like, okay, I can be there Saturday. Like that's the only time I can be there Saturday morning, 6 a.m. I need an hour or two of your time. I've got a bunch of questions. And he, to his credit, he said, okay, I'll meet you there. Um, a lot of uh, managers wouldn't have done that. Um, but he did, he met me there. And before I went into work that Saturday, I got all dressed up. I put on my nicest clothes, which was you know, some jeans and I had a button up black t-shirt I used to roll the sleeves up on and um, went in there and I literally had like two pages of college ruled paper written out with questions and I just drilled them for like two hours. And by the time we finished that up, I said, okay, what do I need to do to get started? And that's how I got into, I got into insurance. I got my licenses, went through an internship program with American National Insurance and then ultimately um, stayed with them, grew an agency there for five years before leaving. So, Wow. I think that uh, at the end of the day, most of us fall into insurance, right? Nobody grows up to be like, I can't wait to be an insurance agent when I'm an adult. Even my kids, you know, I, I obviously need an agency. I'm like, do you want the agency one day? And they're like, no, mom, I don't want to be an insurance agent. <laughs> like they've got, you know, they want to be firefighters and like pilots mm -hmm. and vets and all this, you know, exciting stuff, but it's a great industry to be in. So um, do you regret that decision at all? No, it's, it's been amazing. I didn't, you know, when I got into the business, all I wanted, I didn't even care if I made more money. Um, all I wanted was some of my time back to try and be a, a family man, you know, and getting into this industry, I've been able to make considerably more money, like a hundred times more money, um, which has been just the blessing of my life. My vision has been expanded. My 
empathy and care for my community has expanded, my willingness and desire to want to improve uh, the world we live in. I know it sounds corny, but it's it's true. I've gotten to travel the world um, on somebody else's dime, and then I've gotten to travel the world over again on my own dime. And it's just, it's been the coolest ride. I couldn't have known I wanted this when I got in, but now looking back, uh, I'm so grateful I did, so... Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's a great motivator. I joined the insurance industry for the same reason because I was working corporate and just had no time and my kids didn't even care if I was home and I wanted my life back. And it took a few years to get my life back, right? When you're starting new, it does that. Um, but at the end of the day, it, the, it's all worth it. Um, did you start as a scratch agent? Did you take over an agency? How did that work? No, I started as a scratch, multi-line captive agent, home, auto, life, a little bit of annuity, no book of business, ready, set, go. So and that's quite the change from what you do today because you don't do PNC anymore, right? Just in the life and annuity space now. Um, we gave up our PNC stuff, but we did just launch in January. Our, this will be our fifth concurrent business, um, a property casualty IMO. For those of you that are out there, don't worry. We're not going to come out and, and recruit your agents away. We've got a pretty <laughs> unique twist on it and a pretty small, narrow market. Um, but it's kind of exciting to get back into the space. I'm glad to have partners so that I can be at arm's length and I can I can do the business stuff that I really enjoy doing um, and they can kind of handle the day-to-day -day of property casualty. So, Yeah. And that's a big difference, right? The difference between somebody that is selling insurance or servicing policies within the agency versus running the agency. And in my world, a you know, captive agent also, and that's where you started. That's not really what they teach us. They teach us to be in the office selling insurance and, mm -hmm. you know, working with the customers. But at the end of the day, we all know that that's not how you run a successful business. You have to have great people working with your clients so you can work on your business and not in it. And that's a big misconception, I think, in the captive world that more and more agents are waking up to. So so you were with them for five years and then you left. How come you left? What did you do next? Um, I left really for two reasons. And it's the same two reasons I tell everybody why they should realign or leave or, or whatever. It's the only two reasons, in fact, is a misalignment of core values and or misalignment of core focus. In other words, what do I, mm -hmm. what I want to achieve here, I won't be able to achieve here. And so that was, that was a big part of it. Again, I didn't want to achieve by the, at the time I left, I didn't want to achieve what I wanted to achieve when I first got in. At the time I left, I had a goal and a vision that uh, as an entrepreneur, I wanted to help a hundred people make a hundred thousand dollars a year or more. There was no way I was going to be able to do that as a, as a captive agent solely. Um, mm -hmm. Could I have done other things, all this mastermind stuff we do now? Yeah, but but again, my vision hadn't expanded quite yet at that point um, to where it is now. I just knew I wanted to to help some more people, and then there was some some core value issues um, with uh, some of the unit I was a part of. Not that they're bad people; in fact, they're all great people. Just uh, there were some things they did that rubbed me the wrong way, and some things I did that rubbed them the wrong way, and it was just it was time to go. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, some, some relationships just run their course and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was good. And I tell people to this day, there's always that big argument out there. Captive sucks. Be independent. You make more money. You have more product. You can serve clients better. Um, to some degree, like the commissions are bigger. So, are, so is the expense load and so is the workload, frankly. Um, can you help clients better? Well, you have access to more product. So, so you can be more holistic internally, but as a captive agent, you can be holistic as well if you partner up with other agents that provide product suite that you don't have. And I will say this about captive, the captive life, nobody has the opportunity to understand the relevance um, and value of their product. Like a captive agent does. You only have to focus on a few. Mm -hmm. um, and then nobody receives the support community and culture from day one that a captive gets in the independent world. There's some organizations out there, but they still, it still doesn't meet up to what the captive world tends to provide. And for some people that's worth more than the money, frankly. So. Yeah. I, I definitely know people who have are on both ends of it. Now that I've been working with agents for the last, you know, three years on the independent and captive side of all different companies. And at the end of the day, I tell them neither is perfect. Both are hard. You need to choose what kind of hard you want. Right. So 
on the independent side, you're choosing all your tech stack. You're, you know, you might lose carrier appointments for no goal hitting. You know, if you don't hit the goals, things like that, things, there's things to consider. Um, you have more products, but you have to learn more products. You need to be more of an expert in those products. And there's a lot more ongoing training. So there's, there's good and bad in both. And I was going to, I personally was going to take that independent route and did tons of research, talked to so many agents. And I was like, you know what, at the end of the day, neither is, you know, paradise. They're both difficult businesses to be in. And I, I felt that the captive world was more um, suited for me at this time. Now, like you said, some relationships run their course. And so you might prefer captive in the beginning and independent later. And I know independent agents who went independent from day one and really needed support and help and failed in the independent channel and went captive and did really well. So there's, they're, they both exist for a reason. Um, you know, and, and I agree, like, it's just, you just have to know, you kind of have to know yourself, you know, if you're good with being in business on your own, really, then that's probably fine. But if you really want that camaraderie or you need that, then maybe captives better. So, um, I think there's a place for both people hate on both of them. I've come to the point where I'm like, dude, you just got to know yourself. What do you want to do every day? You got to yeah. know what you want to handle. That, that's exactly it. Like you hit the nail on the head. The grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. And usually that's under your feet. Um, so be where your feet are. Right. But at the end of the day, they're just totally different businesses, mm -hmm. uh, like strip out the, the rhetoric of how ethics and this and that, and the other, like you can be an ethical agent on both sides of that fence, mm -hmm. a very ethical agent on both sides. And you can be very unethical on both sides. Um, at the end of the day, they're totally different profit models, a captive, their number one job is to be an expert marketer, understand my product base and get really good at finding people who have problems. My product base solves mm -hmm. uh, an independent their job is to be an expert implementer. In other words, I can go out and talk to anybody, but I've got to go do the homework to be able to implement a solution for them because I may not know it all off the top of my head. It's always changing and evolving. Um, so I've got to be really, really good at that. And, and again, systems and processes help mitigate some of that workload and stress level as an independent, um, even as a captive, but totally different, totally different mm -hmm. profit models. So. so so you left American National and... Um... Where'd you go after that? What'd you do? Independent. When, when okay. independent. Um, like with a broker, an aggregator? Like what did you, how did you go independent? Some of both. So um, I was fortunate enough at American National to have some pretty um, high level life insurance and annuity production, mm -hmm. both through American National Corporate. And then they allowed us to have some brokerage operations on the life annuity side for things that were outside of their appetite. And um so what I did at American National, uh, by the time I left, that was my second year in a row doing three times more outside than inside. Mm. Um, and so I'd already kind of gotten a little bit of this taste of additional product and whatever, and, and was starting to think, okay, well, for what I want, maybe the answer isn't, isn't here anymore. Um, <clears throat> it certainly was for those five years. And it was, I don't think I would have made it in the business had I started independent. I, I was one of those. So I was as dumb as dumb gets. I will tell you that. Um, and I still am, but I digress. So when I left, I had the production underneath me, the aggregated production on life and annuity specifically that I was able to pick up and maintain um, several carrier direct um, appointments without any issue as far as am I going to be able to hit my minimums? Um, and we did that. And then I uh, also linked up with a with another a broker, a smaller broker. I really, really like them. Most folks haven't heard of them and that's okay. They don't want to be heard of per se. They want they want to grow through referral base um, just with really high end quality agents. And it's I, I really like them in that regard. But we linked up with them in order to uh, expand our, our product base and our suite of products that maybe I couldn't support or I couldn't even get access to. There's a lot of people don't realize this, but, you know, just because I can go get maybe Allianz Direct to support my product base, that might support their term product, maybe some Life Pro stuff. Um, I was doing a lot with Allianz at the time. I don't do a ton with them on the life side anymore, but but I could support those. But Allianz might have an entire other product base. They won't let me touch unless I'm north of like five million per year in premium uh, with just them. And so by partnering up with this broker, I was able to access all this additional stuff. And lo and behold, at the same time, that was the first time that I realized, hey, there's more to this game than just like street, high street. And then we started getting into some agency level uh, and even IMO level comps. That was the first time it was like, holy crap, you know, 
some of these whole life companies will pay 160, 170% on a life contract. They won't pay it to me, but they'll pay it to these guys. So these guys will let me have 110, 120. And if I went and got that contract myself, I was only going to get 80 or 90 anyway. So mm -hmm. I make more by being with them. Plus they give me products, tools, uh, support, all this other stuff and, and expand my, my base. So that's how I started. Um, mm -hmm. We ended up, as I started growing my coaching platform at the time, a little bit simultaneously, um, a lot of the agents I was working with were independent and they lacked some product suite. Uh, you know, maybe they were only doing final expense or something like that. And it was like, well, you know, I can get you access to some IUL stuff. So we started setting up our own life and annuity IMO. And the thing just kind of took off. We actually put on organically over the course of a couple of years, two and a half years, we put on about 250 agents. And it was, wow. it was just kind of weird. It wasn't something I intended. It was just me trying to be like, nice, hey, here's the product base. And it got to be a big headache. So the broker I was working with at the time, I ended up selling that IMO over to them. And we brought our, our whole organization underneath them at that time. So sold them the IMO. I kept a few agents underneath me in downline. And then obviously my own internal agency. And, and we set up kind of a MGA, uh, so to speak, underneath their IMO. And it's been a really good relationship since. So That's awesome. Yeah. So, so talk about, you've already touched a little bit on the coaching. So what is that like? What do you do with coaching? Tell us about that program. Yeah. So we do a lot. Coaching started with anyone who's a top producer knows your phone freaking rings. Everybody wants to know what are you doing? And then you get tired of telling them because they ain't going to do it anyways. <laughs> yeah. um, but it got that to the where I was taking so much time to talk to agents. I wasn't producing and it started affecting my revenue. And it's not like oh, well, you know, little Mr. Bougie over here can't buy his boat. No, it was affecting my ability to not necessarily make payroll. We were okay on that, but how do I provide continued opportunity for the people that are in my agency? How do I provide continued opportunity for people who aren't in my agency yet? And how do I pour more value back out in my own community if I'm not making the money, right? Business revolves on money. And so started charging for coaching. It's like a thousand bucks a month. We'll do a one-on-one -on -one every single week. And very targeted that grew to where um we were doing 20 i had 22 people 22 hours of zoom every single week with other people's problems it was exhausting and some people are doing the math in their head like 22,000 a month on just coaching um you know why do anything else well i mean that was maybe a tenth of the money we were making so that's why we do everything else but it was eating up half of my time and 100 percent of my energy and that's when it was about this time of year, um, like March-ish actually of 2021, that I started looking around and was like, I want to do this. I really enjoy the coaching. I'm really enjoying seeing how I can help somebody not only improve their own career, but drive better value in a myriad of ways to their own communities, to the moms and paws in their communities. So I started looking for how do I build something that's more scalable, takes less of my time. And that's, that journey is kind of how Rev Agency Syndicate was, was born. Prior to that, it was just our coaching. I think we called it like Prosper Coaching. My business at the time was called Prosper Wealth Management. So it was just a, a tee off of that. But, but yeah, we went to work. We built, um, we built out the first iteration of, of Rev, which started with a group we call Rev Rush. That's all we had. Um, and the intention was I'll dump a ton of money into infrastructure so that we can scale this thing, we're going to focus on um, having, you know, some pre-recorded stuff, but granular, like screw, if you want motivational, go watch Tony Robbins on YouTube. Like, let's tell you where to point, where to click, what words to say, when to say them, how to run an illustration, uh, how to put together an automation, all of it on a very granular level. And then let's back that up with the, that recorded stuff with weekly live support calls as a group instead of one-on-one. -on -one. Now I could help a hundred people in an hour instead of one person that hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, let's host a forum or a community where everybody can collaborate together 24 seven. And that's, that's how Rev Agency Syndicate was born. From there, it's grown into um, three groups. Currently we have plans for a fourth. I just need a couple more people ready for it before we, before we launch it, but three groups, all of them part of a, a sole community. 
is what we call it. And some people are like, my hell, this is turning into a cult. Um, <laughs> who knows? Maybe we buy some property, open up a commune. We'll <laughs> get naked and squish grapes with our feet. And it's going to be great. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. But, um, but no, we call it a community because it, it really is that. And, and you've been a part of it for a while now. Like you can see, like, it's kind of cool um, how agents of all different kinds, we've got health agents, life agents, PNC agents, multi-line independents, captives from all over, all over right now. And in fact, I think right now we've got four countries represented. Um, oh, wow. I didn't know you were international. Just, That's awesome. Yeah. They're all just leaning into each other. Uh, we just hit a couple of weeks ago, um, 200 members in our community, all organic. We've never spent a dollar on paid ads or, or anything like that. That's a, that's a lie. We tried it once, spent like 500 bucks. Um, we actually had a whole bunch of people come in and we had to give them their money back and kick them out because they did not fit our core values. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, we've turned in, into that. We've got these four groups starting with let's provide value to somebody who's brand new in the business, um, trying to figure out how do I make my first paycheck? Um, that same value can be extrapolated to the person who's making a million dollars a year, but is having a hard time getting their own team up to speed. Let's get mm. your team plugged into this and, and that's how it can help you. So we start all the way there. Then we move to, okay, you're making your paychecks. How do we get you to a couple hundred thousand a year? Um, then how, from a couple hundred thousand a year, how do we take you and, and take your production, all, all these systems you put in place that, that work really well and add scale to it. So you can start plugging people ethically and profitably into this, you know, none of this, um, let's hire people and pay them 20,000 bucks a damn year. Uh, no, let's provide six figure opportunities for everybody. And then even above and, and beyond that. So that's what Rev has turned into is this progressive scale of where are you at in your, in your agency? A lot of it's been built off of my journey and my experience to building a, a multi seven figure dollar agency. Um, and, uh, so there's, there's a lot of me in there, but the more the community grows, what's really cool is seeing everybody else lean into it and want to help provide training. So now we're starting to get other people that have either built a seven figure agency on their own and have some other perspective, um, or they've come up over the last 20 months through what we've done and gone from a hundred thousand to 800,000 in, in 20 months. And now they're able to help lean in and like, Hey, you know, here's, here's the way I did it. Here's the way I took it and tweaked it or, or whatever. And, um, it's just been, it's, it's been amazing to see it grow. So it's been very fulfilling. Yeah. I, like you mentioned, I've been in the group for a while now. I get to see the posts and everything. I, I need to go spend time to go through the course a lot. Um, the, there was one actually just yesterday um, that this agent said, my property and casualty sales are up 398% and life sales are up 308 compared to this time last year. Um, so I, I'm literally reading this off your group right now. Um, you know what? I'm not still not satisfied because I know true greatness lies beyond my comfort zone. It goes on uh, as well, but this is, you know, his time with you in his journey. And am I saying that everyone's going to have a, you know, three, 400% increase in their production? No, but I love in your group. What I love about it is that it boil, it all boils down to action. And you talk about that so much, right? You can join any coaching program. You can implement any system. You can buy any marketing, whatever you want to spend money on. But at the end of the day, the only thing that makes the difference is your actions and putting things in place and actually holding yourself accountable. And I think that's one of my favorite things about the group because I follow several, um, not a lot of coaching groups, but I follow several groups and you just have a very, um, a very straightforward way of, you know, saying, look in the mirror, we're providing you all the training that you need, look in the mirror and follow it and use it. And then of course, people are still going to some will, some won't, right? Like you mentioned earlier, you, you talk to all these agents, they have problems and then you help them, you spend several hours and then they don't implement. That's so frustrating when you're trying to provide value. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, that's one of the things I love the most about the group is it's very straightforward and there's, there's no BS. There's no, you know, like you said, Tony Robbins, I've only watched a little bit of his stuff, but at the end of the day, I feel like he's just a really good cheerleader. Yeah. And, and <laughs> right? I don't need, need a cheerleader. That. I someone need to call, I need someone to call me on my BS, be like, stop it. And that's what you, you're really good at that in the group. Yeah. Like sometimes we need the cheerleading. Sometimes we had a really bad day and all we need is a bag of cheddar ruffles, some Hagen dazs and some Tony Robbins. <laughs> like some days we need somebody to look us in the eye and just be like, look, you can keep feeding yourself the freaking placebo on purpose on purpose but all you're going to have is is placebo based results you'll feel better for a minute and then nothing ever changes like you've got to 
I always tell folks like, and you've probably heard me say it, what you have to do to become successful in this business or, or really in business in general, when, especially when you scratch start, it's, it's an ungodly or a godly amount of effort, whatever side of that coin you're on, but it's a lot. And, and it's a red pill that you have to swallow that it's on you. Nobody else is going to do it for you. I can't come through the phone and go knock those doors for you or pick up the phone and make those calls. Your upline can't do it. They're not paid to do it, right? They're paid to bring you on and they're trying to feed their family too. And so I always tell people like, it's a red pill of truth. And for most, it's not even like a pill you get to swallow. It's a suppository. You get to sit and spin on it for a while, but that's, that's how you get through it. Like if you take the damn medicine, in other just words, laughing because it's so true. Work, yeah. <laughs> then, then all of a sudden <laughs> shit starts happening. And I think that's my favorite part of the community as well. It's not just my narrative. I, I feel like I was, I'm the least part of this thing. I was just the the one bastard that's crazy enough to, to dump a bunch of money into this and, and um, start it up. But, um, but it's, it's the rest of the community, everybody mm -hmm. leaning into everybody else, regardless of company, contract, carrier, commission, and, and it's cool to see 200 people 24 seven, holding each other's feet to the fire. Um, I think that's what makes it more, uh, maybe a little more unique than, than some of the other programs that are out there that are great programs. It's just that, that culture that's driven, um, through community and what the culture at, at the end of the day provides is accountability. I've, I've come to believe I was speaking for, uh, the Utah NAFA symposium down in Salt Lake city couple of weeks ago. And that's one of the things that I was telling them was, you know, to grow in our business, there, there has to be accountability and accountability can't exist in, in, um, in absence of two things, expectations and culture. And, and you've got to have both. And I think that that community, again, do we teach some good stuff? I think we do, but I think that community is 90% responsible for getting people off their ass, getting them to do, even if they don't do all the work, do enough that it changes your life and, um, and the rest will come. So, yeah. And, and I would, um, I would agree with that as far as the accountability piece, the insurance industry can be very lonely, right. Depending on if you're captive or independent, you may have literally nobody calling or checking or wondering or caring what you're doing every day. And at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, a business owner, we have to be honest enough with ourselves to look ourselves in the mirror and say, what am I not good at? And if accountability and kind of that feet to the fire type of mentality. It's just something that you struggle with. Like look for places where you can get that support. You know, you might look at yourself as a business owner and say, man, I'm really not good with budgeting. I'm not good at marketing or whatever it is that your weakness is. We all have them, right? None of us are perfect in all areas. Right. So, so reach out and find resources that can help you in those areas because the business owners that will succeed are the ones who do look for help in their areas of weaknesses. And then the ones who will fail and won't be around they're, they're just, you know, they think they know everything they can do it better. Um, they're not willing to learn. And one of my favorite things about this industry is that there is, there's just, it's a never ending learning process. The industry is changing right now, right? Where I was just at, uh, um, accelerate last week and we you know we're talking tech stacks and the emergent boom of insure tech and, you know, just all of this stuff. And if you go back even five years ago, <clears throat> nobody in my world, at least was talking about tech stacks and, and insurance technology, you know, and automation. And, you know, we were all using paper files and notepads on our, on our desk and things like that. It's, it's an ever-changing industry. So you want to stay up on it. You want to um, stay relevant, make sure you are um, using resources to make that easier for you. Because at the end of the day, we're dealing with, you know, staff members show up late or a customer called, not a question, or there's a system glitch, or we can't get a binder issued on time, you know, like, that's the day to day in an agency. But if you want to grow your agency, you got to be working on it and finding resources that can help you find better, better, more efficient ways to win. Um, so you said 200 agents are in your group, right? Mm -hmm. 200 agents. And there's four tiers. How does that, how do you kind of, is it one-on-one? -on -one? The agents pick their tier. Can they jump in at any tier? How does that work? Um, they can't jump in at any tier. The two top tiers have pre-qualifiers to, to be able to get in that we uh, like are, they're absolutely non-negotiable. Um, the, the bottom two tiers, any agent can get in, but we still try and be more consultative with it. So we'll usually talk to an agent. This is one of the reasons why I don't like running paid advertising to get people in the groups. Like I want my team to be on the phone with somebody before they jump in. Let's figure out number one, are you going to be a good fit? Cause maybe you're a douche or maybe you think we're douches and, and we shouldn't do business together anyways. 
Um, but at the same time, maybe, you know, you believe your problem is that, uh, you're not closing enough business, right? I need, I need sales help strategy. I need to run illustrations better. Um, hell, I'm, I might even need automation, but we can get on the phone with you. And in, in five or 10 minutes, it turns out that you think you need all these things so that you can make more money. Cause you're looking at it and you're like, well, if I could be better at all those things, then the five people I am talking to every single month, um, maybe I could close, you know, four out of five of those and, um, then I can make my nut and, and be okay. But here's reality. If you're only talking to five people a month, your problem isn't automation. Your problem isn't sales. Your problem isn't not knowing how to illustrate. Your problem isn't a product problem. Your problem is you're simply not in front of enough people who give a damn about having the conversation you're trying to have. You need marketing help. You need help getting in front of more people. End of story. And marketing comes in a lot of forms. It could be buying leads. It could be running Facebook ads. It could be, um, knocking doors, doing partnerships, networking, like there's so many things that can be considered marketing, but that's, that's what you need. And so we may, we may tell you, Hey, even though you're willing to cut a check for 500 bucks a month for one year, that's one thing about our groups is, um, the second, third and fourth group, um, it's only one year of expense and then it falls off. The idea is let's not take people for all they're worth. Let's get enough that we can afford to run this thing, but that's it not looking to get rich on it. I'll sell insurance and, and keep getting rich. But, um, but <laughs> you may be willing to cut that check for 500 bucks a month, uh, for the next year to, to be in this group. Cause you think you need that. But in reality, as soon as you get in there, the first thing I'm going to tell you, you need is more people. Like what good is a CRM and a pipeline? If you don't have anybody to put in it. Right. right? And it doesn't take long to establish we like to call it a strategic marketing plan. It doesn't take long, 30 to 90 days. But instead of giving me your 500 bucks a month here, let's start you down here. It's a hundred bucks a month, 97 a month. Um, and let's get you dialed into your strategic marketing plan. Let's get you doing some homework and some training on, you know, if you decide knocking doors is the way that uh, one of the ways you're going to earn some business, let's not just decide that and then trial by fire. No, I knocked doors for years and years and years. The first million per year I made was my knocking doors. Um, and running a team of door knockers, rely on my experience, compress your timeline and, and we can get you up to speed where you're in three to five quality conversations per day inside of like 60 days. And that's actually, um, for each of these groups, we apply a hundred percent money back guarantee. If you come in, you do the work, whatever, you'll see X result for that beginning group. That's the result we tell them Then 60 days, you implement this three to five quality conversations. You can add to your pipeline every single day. Now you're ready to step up and start working on all your systems, processes, automation, sales skills, uh, strategies, all this other stuff. But, but prior to that, like who the hell are you going to use those good scale sell skills to, you mm -hmm. know, it's not going to buy insurance from you. So, so not only helping them figure out what tier they're at, but kind of like what, what is their underlying problem that's holding them back from their goal. And it sounds like you cover, like you said, marketing, automation, the actual presentations, product knowledge. Um, is there anything like that an agent would be needing to help with or coaching that you don't do? Or is it pretty much everything that you could experience in an agency? Um, I mean, there's a lot I can't do. Like um, you're lonely and you, you need a new woman or man, like figure it out yourself. <laughs> At some point, we're going to get Not big a enough. Dating people service. in the group. We're going to start <laughs> marrying people in the group. But Oh my gosh. Can you imagine an insurance agent marrying an insurance agent? That sounds horrible to me. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, to your question, I actually have, is it okay if I share my screen for like, five yeah, seconds? go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know there's so much you do. I was like, maybe it's a shorter list of what you don't do, but um, yeah, whatever, however you want to share it, go ahead. There's a lot we don't do. And, and right now, um, the higher you go up in the groups, the more life insurance and annuity focused it is in a lot of ways. Um, at the bottom end, we've got health only, Medicare only, life only, PNC only, multi-line, like that group is helpful for literally everyone. Even if they're already making a million a year, they get in, now they have new stuff to teach their team and all of a sudden their team starts taking off more. And uh, you're not talking about a million a year in premium. You're talking about I'm a million a year. Talking in about, yeah, a million a year in commission, revenue. Commission. Thank you. Yeah. That gets confused a lot in some of these discussions, so. Yeah, no, uh, we don't even, so we track, we'll track premium for carrier reports. We track two things in, in my agency on the life annuity side. Um, the first thing we track is uh, benevolence to community. So we track death benefit. In fact, inside of our community, 
we've got a goal this year as a community to do a billion dollars in, in face amount life insurance. Um, and we've, we've already wow. got several hundred million. Um, and then the other thing we track is actual revenue, gross revenue to the agency. So premiums irrelevant at, at the end of the day. It's, you know, just a multiple. So let me show you this, um, I guess, real quick. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this is a presentation I do called Four Steps to a Seven-Figure Master Agency. And it's it's all built on the back of the process I found to, um, and I've done it three times now, gone from scratch to seven plus figures in revenue, in actual commissions um, with, with an insurance agency. And each time it goes faster. Well, these four steps I'll show you real quick. These are literally our groups. And the way we built it, as people rank up through our groups, they still get access to every group underneath. So in this first group here, the entirety of our community exists there. We have agents that are brand new, and we literally have agents that are making millions of dollars in, in this base group here. But this base group is, is here to solve the first problem that every insurance agent has, which is that you're not in front of enough people. We need to get in front of more people, right? So in this group, we help them do a few things. And again, like I said, we have recorded modules that they can watch at their own pace. Um, live calls we do on a on a very regular basis. Those all get recorded and uploaded to the same member portal that they log into to watch the modules. Um, we run a, a private group, a Facebook group for them so they can all collaborate. And then they get a ton of other free value. Like we've got, we have a big event coming up. Um, it's a pretty high dollar event in four weeks. Um, so they get some discounts on that, but we've got another event we're going to put on this fall and uh, we'll likely have several hundred people there. And anyone inside of our groups gets to come for like 50 to a hundred bucks instead of the three or 400, it's going to cost someone else who's not inside. So there's a ton of other stuff they get to do. And we've got, like I say, some big name speakers. Most people will never get an opportunity to, to see or, or very rare opportunities to see. Um, but yeah. The idea is this, with, with a strategic marketing plan, agents need to get focused. There's a million, million dollar ideas, but the only real million dollar ideas are the ones you make a million dollars on, right? So with a strategic yeah. marketing plan, it is all about, we run them through a five point filter on, on these things. Are you able to do it? Willing to do it? Do you find fulfillment in it? Is it profitable? And is it efficient? Or in other words, can it be scaled, right? Mm -hmm. And and um, we'll use that as a filter for what things should you actually be considering as far as your marketing plan goes. And then we have them pick one of each of these things, one green, one yellow, one red, they can implement every single day. And by the way, this is some free value for y'all. Uh, the, the training we provide, it's a lot more granular, but if you can take this and run with it after watching this and go implement it, I guarantee you three to five quality conversations every single day inside of 60 days by implementing this you got to work well, and i love i love in the set the piece the filters you have the willing able fulfillment because the willing and the fulfillment um are a big piece that people don't consider there are so many marketing ideas out there and when i started insurance i was my mentor told me you know here's the five marketing plans you were going to implement and i found that two of them I just dreaded doing it. And I would find any excuse in the world not to go, oh, my kid, you know, they sneezed this morning, so I can't come or whatever it was because I wasn't willing and I didn't feel fulfilled in it. And that is huge because marketing only works when it's consistent. If you're really inconsistent, then you're not going to have the lift. And I don't think people consider that when they really put in money and effort into a marketing plan. Exactly. So it's like at the end of the day, for us to build a, a profit model off of this, a business strategy, right? Something we're going to feed our family with and drive value to our community. We've got to do it consistently, like you said. Like consistency compounds consistently, but the inverse is true. If you're not consistent, you will never compound any amount of success. That's how mm -hmm. it works. Like two plus two equals four. It's not a mystery. It's freaking math. <laughs> so we've got to be consistent. And if I'm not willing to do an activity, it doesn't matter how much potential is there or how much that person across the street made money at that. If I'm not willing to do it. I'm not going to do it. So mm -hmm. quit beating yourself up about the success you're not having from the work you're not doing. Take it off the damn list and replace it. Fulfillment, if you don't find a way to enjoy it, you will find a way to quit doing it. You may do it for a month. You may do it for a year, but eventually you will quit. And when you quit doing it, everything dries up and goes away. So we want to run our, our marketing plans, our strategic marketing plans through this five-point filter 
so that we don't have wasted time of having to drop back 10 and punt every freaking six months, right? This yeah. is one of the ways we compress timelines by being very intentional about what we put in front of ourselves. So um, if you, like I said, green, yellow, red, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but if you want to pause the video as you're watching it and, and you can read what those are all about, but that's how you do it. So that's our group we call Revel. That's that's the premise of the conversation in, in Revel, right? When we move into Rush, Rush is all built off of, this is again, what we originally launched and then Revel was an afterthought. It was like, holy shit, people need, people need help even getting to this point. We thought this was step one. No, we got to get them there. So um, Rush is built on three pillars. Once you're in front of enough people, now we need to increase your conversion rate, right? How well you're converting on those leads and how long you're retaining them as, as a client, and then how well you're reselling or penetrating vertically um, to increase your, your personal profit model. We do that through three pillars. Pillar number one is developing more quality conversations. This is sales stuff. It's the difference between, hey, you've got a mortgage for $400,000. Uh, what are your thoughts on a life insurance policy? And Mr. Jones, you're paying $3,000 a month for your slice of the American dream. But if you choke on a cigarette butt tomorrow, that could go away. That could go away. You're paying $3,000 a month for your mortgage, homeowner's insurance, property tax. Did you realize for $50 to $100 a month, I could guarantee if you choke on that cigarette butt that um, not only do we pay your house off, but we give your family the money to put food on the table for years to come afterwards. I feel like you work hard enough. You owe yourself that $50 to $100 bucks a month, don't you? Like That's a quality conversation. It takes a little bit of time and intention to put that together and practice it so that I can deliver that value. It's the same thing. It's a life insurance policy for the purpose of covering mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. But I can deliver better value by being more intentional and, and doing some training. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is making sure we can deliver those quality conversations with flawless consistency. There's that word again. And we do that through implementing effective systems and processes. So CRMs, automations, uh, automated calendar function. I think that's the first automation everybody should apply like is an automated calendar in my opinion. Oh yeah. Like whole if you have to go back and forth and ask people when they're available and have them check their kids sports schedule and their wife's, you know, work schedule, like you just, you're making it life so much harder. The calendar right. is just a must. Right. I, I saw a Facebook post today from a guy and he was like, if you send me your calendar link, it automatically tells me you don't value me and you're not willing. Like I'm just a number. Cause I'm in, now I'm in your CRM and, and all this other stuff. And I didn't say anything to it, but my immediate response is like, are you kidding me? The reason I do a counter link is, is empathy. It's because I give a damn. I give a damn about you. I don't want to lose track of you. I need to guarantee it ends up on my calendar and I show up at that appointment. I need to guarantee I don't spend 10 minutes setting an appointment that should take 10 seconds for you to click a link to set because I've got a hundred other people that want value from me as well. Mm -hmm. So by be giving too much of myself to you, I have to literally extract it from the community because there's so many dams you can give in a single day and how selfish is it of you to demand more of me um and, and less that i can give to somebody else so totally anyways. agree it's it's literally just saving time like you want me to waste your time and call you four times to make an appointment or do you want to pick when you can come in that you know works for you like it's it's one of those things but i think that a lot of that i don't know how old that guy was but i think a lot of it's generational because um, for people my age and younger, I know that like, if I, even my hairstylist, I do, when I first moved here, she drove me crazy back and forth appointments. I'm like, you need an online calendar. You're driving me yes. bananas. I just want to click. I need my haircut or any color. I want to know when I can do it. It took her six months, but she finally got one. I was in there the other day. She had an online calendar. She's like, we're booked out for like three months because people can just book. I'm like, isn't that a beautiful thing? It's just so much easier and you don't need to go back and forth with people. Um, I told, yeah, totally agree. Keep going. That's so Sorry. funny. I literally, when I moved up here to Idaho, my barber was the same way. I literally, um, over the last few months here, I've gotten her set up on calendar automation, a CRM for automated uh, reminders, this and that, and the other, revenue tracking, the whole nine yards. It was like, you need this in your life. You do. A Isn't good that funny though, too? Like when you. you're, when you're a business owner and you see the pain points of other business owners, it doesn't even matter what industry you just like want to help them. There's a gal in my son's baseball team who just, she's an esthetician and she just went on on her own. And I was like, you need to set up your Google page. You know, do you have this, do you have that? And she's like, I don't know how to do any of that. And so I gave her my phone number. I'm like, let's go have coffee, bring your laptop. I'll set it up for you. But you feel their 
you know those pain points because you've been through all of it and you have to piece it together and there's no like manual here's how you run your business right it's just learn as you go so anyways that, that's awesome right. i'm so glad you did that no i i love it but but yeah that's like so with automation right on systems and processes everybody's big worry is and you've heard it a thousand times like we were talking about that i don't want to be replaced by a computer or um, you'll even hear like my clients are older they don't want it well let me tell you my average client age um, is 58 to 68. And my clients love automation. I haven't taken an app over the phone or in person for life insurance or annuity in years. I text them a link, they click a link, they fill it out, comes back to me, my team copy and paste it to an e-app and it goes right back to them. Like done, done, done. Um, and guess what? I get emails, I get letters, I get reviews on Google, all this stuff about how buying annuities from me was the best experience they've ever had out of the last five annuities they bought from, from their previous at-home brick-and-mortar advisor. I'm not saying this is better than brick-and-mortar. What I'm saying is automation is not here to replace agents. In fact, there are several AI, so we see this in life insurance right now quite a bit. Um, you may remember, I won't name any names of companies, but um, really through like 2017, 2018, through about 2021, 2022, we saw some AI life insurance underwriters. You can go right to them. They'd find a policy, select it, um, submit an application right from there, um, and basically totally remove the agent. As an agent, you could subscribe to them and host them on your website and get a small piece, right? That was their model. Well, those companies are totally backtracking at this point. They're totally backtracking. The AI did not do a good job of replacing the agent. What they're rebranding as, these same companies, and I'm sure, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. I just... Again, I'm not here to name names, but those same companies now are rebranding as better tools for agents. In other words, quoting and case building tools um, for agents because the their profitability did not match the amount of uh, infrastructure and investment they had to make. Um, they weren't profitable. Mm -hmm. The agent force is profitable. Technology is here. This is another thing that I, I spoke on at, at that NAFA meeting in, in uh, Utah. That technology is here to to improve your capacity as an agent for growth for service but more than anything for empathy like we keep talking about how our business is a business built on the back of benevolence well how little do you have to give a damn and how arrogant and ignorant do you have to be to sit here and say that you're going to do a better job at scheduling than this thing that doesn't sleep doesn't eat doesn't ever get sick doesn't back talk doesn't it just keeps doing exactly what i told it to do until i tell it to stop it never ever misses. And by the way, as soon as it's scheduled, I can guarantee at the the perfect, exact perfect intervals, my clients are going to receive the exact perfect language to follow up to ensure that they actually get to the appointment with the documents they need. And that's empathy because I know I have value to deliver. And and I like you go talk to 90% of insurance agents out there. We're all big headed, right? And we're like, I'm better than than the guy or gal across the street, you know? I'm going to have the best customer service. I sell the best policies. I do it right. Like every insurance agent says that, right? It's not a unique value. In fact, that's it's like the standard. Every insurance agent says that. Well, if you really believed that and you were really that good, why why on earth would you believe that you don't have a moral obligation to do more of it? Because if you really are that good, doesn't it make you an asshole for not implementing uh, technology to help increase your capacity for all these things? And letting more of your community's business go across the street where they get less service, less quality, quality policies, less whatever, it does indeed make you the asshole, not the hero for saving your clients from technology. And again, my clients, they're older. They all respond to my emails. They all respond to my texts. They all like, they love me. Does that mean everybody loves me? No, I don't do business with the ones that don't. They can keep being, you know, your client or not yours, Mariah, but just, you know, in the general use of the term, they can keep being your <laughs> headache. My clients are all really, really good clients that value my willingness and desire to pour more value in um, all the time, to always look for new ways to increase my capacity to grow and give value. That's what technology does. It's important. Uh, yeah. And I, I think there's a lot to be said too about like, you know, you said your clients or right? the people that you target, you know, your age range, you know, the people that you want to talk to. If you get on the phone or someone, you know, throws a fit that you sent them a calendar link, that's probably not someone that's a good fit for your business model and what you want to do going forward to how you can spend your time. And that is another big problem that agents don't like kind of 
I guess, just accept the fact that not every person is going to be your ideal client. Know who your ideal client is and what target market you want to work with. The smallest example I have is like, there's an agent in my town who's just down the road who has a big billboard out that says he does SR22 insurance. I am so glad he wants to do that because I don't want to do that. And that's okay, right? I know who my clients are. If one of my clients needs it, sure, I can do it, but I'm not going to market to that that demographic of customers, you market to a very different demographic of customers than I do. And that's okay. Um, but the problem is, is when we get hung up on those clients who want to complain and we, per we allow that to prevent us from doing the things we know is right. So I had, um, you know, we, we, we don't take cash in our agency. Like we, if you've cash, sorry, we're just not taking it. We're not set up for that. There's risk there. There's reasons we've made the decision. And if, if someone insists, you should go somewhere else, right? We just don't do that. But I'm not going to change the way my agency operates because one person complains. I'm not going to not send automated email campaigns because one person replied and said, how dare you send me an automated email campaign, right? Like, don't get hung up on that. It's okay. It's there, you know, you need to do what's right for your business. Um, and like you said, some people are going to really like it and some people aren't. That's all right. And that, yeah, that's, that's how it is. It's, it's crazy. I was talking to this agent. I don't want to beat the horse too much, but um, I was talking to this agent, really older agent at that NAFA event um, that that came up. And I had some mixed reviews. If you're familiar with NAFA, you've got a young upcoming crowd in, in NAFA. That's really great to see. Um, you've got some older generation crowd that really wants to stay relevant still. And then you've got those that just don't give a shit. They're retiring in the next five years anyways. It's not worth making the changes. I've got what I've got. And for them, cool. That client that doesn't fit me, they can have them. I hope they're able to serve them to, you know, the absolute utmost of expectations and, and whatever. But this agent came up to me, this particular one and older agent, you know, probably 65, 70 years old, getting up there, re ready to retire. And he's like, I never had thought about the fact that I have a moral obligation to lean into some of this stuff. And he's like, you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of all those years ago when we went from rating guides in a book to using computer programs to run our quotes. And we fought it like hell. We fought it like hell. I can't, like, I wouldn't even know how. I ran an agency for years, quoting out of a book. I wouldn't even know how to anymore. And I wouldn't want to. This is so much better. Um, and that's how it is, you know? Years ago, everybody was spreadsheeting uh, retirement information. Now you don't. You just, uh, you you subscribe to a service like Trax or Retirement Analyzer. You punch in the data, it spits it out. It has bar graphs, it has historical data, it has all this cool stuff. It increases your capacity to be an excellent agent. And um, for those that'll lean into it, sky's the limit. So that's that's one of the next steps though, because like I say, eh, we develop these quality conversations and, and we do a lot of product training, um, strategy training and, and a lot of different things. Um, but like all this intelligence, all this, sales skills and, and cool product design and all this strategy, it's all just wasted in, in vanity if we don't effectively communicate it with, with absolute consistency, right? And, um, and so that's what it does. The one other thing I'll say for systems and processes is they increase your capacity to be compliant without worry. Like if you're in business long enough, you're going to have complaints, you're going to have issues, you're going to have this. Systems and processes, totally remove it. Number one, you know it always got done right. Number two, you know, the disclosure was always there. Number three, the data was always cached so that you can not C-A-S-H-C-A-C-H-E. Data was always cached so you can always go and export it and send it off to the state or the carrier or whoever. And that's that's you responding to a complaint now instead of staying up all night, worrying, jumping on the phone tomorrow with managers. No, it was done right. I can guarantee that and I have the evidence. Well, then talk about like from scaling your staff, right? Hiring staff members. You might think, well, I do it right every single time, but I'm pretty sure you don't want to be the one doing everything in your business forever. So when you do hire staff and if you don't have clear systems, it leaves them open to make mistakes that you're responsible for. So, you know, even if you're thinking, well, I don't need that. I do it on myself. I got my process like, okay, is your process, can you duplicate it? Can you hand it off to someone clearly and concisely and make sure that there's not errors happening? Um, that's a huge piece. That's exactly it. Like in our business, the shit rolls uphill. Not yeah, downhill, I know, right? right? So, so we have to build uh. it in. And it's funny you mentioned that because literally the next step is scaling ethically and effectively. Like it's no wonder why you've got to learn to get in front of people. <laughs> For anyone who, knew, who is watching, I did not know that was the next step. So like, I didn't lead that on by on purpose, total accident. <laughs> Keep going. No, perfect <laughs> transition though, because that's, that's exactly it. Now that I have an established 
scalable model of, of marketing and not just marketing for me, but I also understand how to build a strategic marketing plan because I'll have one for me. I've got one for my agency, but everybody in my agency probably needs their own as well. They've got different personalities and different things. I don't care how they do their marketing. I care about the result on the back end. So if you don't want to knock doors, don't knock doors, do something else. that's going to bring in the same revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Through that five point filter and, and whatever, and then plug it in through those systems processes, work on your sales skills. And that's how, this is how you provide and guarantee six figure opportunities as you start to scale. And if you're already scaled, you already have team in place. Cool. Go back and hit those first two steps mm -hmm. or plug your team into that. Have your, have your office manager jump into step number two and start implementing systems and processes so that you guys can continue to scale. But with scale, I've found really um, a, three things here that, that people need to focus on. Number one, we gotta get super intentional um, about how we're going to scale. And so we answer these questions, who, what, where, when, how, and why. We do the, these in the form of a VTO, it's a vision traction organizer. And, um, and I didn't make up vision traction organizer. It's part of the EOS program, the EOS program. Um, go read the book Traction and Rocket Fuel. Great books, uh, really boring to read, honestly, but tons of good information. Um, I believe, or, or I believe it because I've been told it. Um, I promise my head is not as big as it seems, but I don't know, maybe it is. Um, I believe we've got a unique implementation of the VTO that hits home for insurance agents and financial advisors, especially, but but it's just a little more um, applicable. We take it to another another level of granularity that allows us to use it as a tool that that really is absolutely effective. So we help uh, develop all these things. And why do we do these before we start scaling? Because like core values, for example, that's not just who I am. It's who I, I need somebody to be and, and striving to be in order to work with them consistently. Otherwise, I'm going to bring you on and fire you and bring you on and fire you. And I'm always dropping back 10 to punt. Can't win a football game that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, I want to know, uh, like I need to really not just define, but then figure out how to effectively communicate what that core value is. So for example, one of mine is honesty. And with honesty, of course, like if I say that, you're probably like, okay, don't lie to him or he's going to get pissed. But then I might look you in the windows of your soul, Mariah, and I'm like, go, go a level deeper. You know, like, okay, I need to be honest with myself. Like, yeah, well, no shit, right? If you're lying to yourself, you're not getting anywhere either. But when I really look at honesty, the time I feel, the times I feel like I'm lied to the most, it's not the times that people look me in the eyes and tell me something other than what was. It's the times that they refuse to make commitments to me. I feel mm -hmm. like they're lying. It's a lie through omission. So one of my pieces that I use to communicate my core value of honesty is that you need to be able, willing, and driven to make and keep commitments. You have to be honest through commission, not omission, right? And um, we talked about accountability and accountability can't exist in lieu of, or, or in the absence of culture and expectations. But if I fail to set the expectation about honesty appropriately, how am I gonna hold this team accountable to it, right? So we get really granular with that. Then we start developing carrots and sticks. And a lot of agents, like this is one of the most, um, when you're scaling an agency, is one of the most underutilized uh, concepts in insurance. Why? Because you're not paying them, a carrier's paying them for like your sub producers, right? Mm -hmm. CSRs, you might be paying, uh, you, you'll develop some comp contracts for that. And this is true for CSRs, producers, downline. Um, if you're a, a district manager, this is true. This is what sets you apart. Like you need a unique value proposition and your opportunity to come and grow a book of business is not a freaking unique opportunity. Everybody's offering that. Okay. So with the carrot and the stick, the idea is that everybody's driven by one of two things or both things. We're driven by carrots or sticks, the bait in front of us or, or the switch behind us. Right. Mm. And so when our comp contracts, we really want to start developing additional things. If the carrier is paying your people, Cool. What else can I give? How can I split off just a little more? It doesn't have to be much. It may not even be a commission. It may be an Olive Garden gift card. It may be a, but I need to standardize that because if I can't standardize it, I can't I can't um, do two things. I can't communicate it well and I can't hold anybody accountable to it, right? It's a failure to set an expectation. But then also I need to set a stick. So like a stick for me 
is in my in my contracts to come and work with me, you sign on that you are agreeing to live and abide by my core values. Now, I'm not perfect. It, even in my own core values, I slip, other people slip. So we're, we're forgiving. But if you're out of integrity and I call you out on it and you refuse to get back in alignment, it's time to go, right? But I got to put, again, I can't hold you accountable to an expectation I didn't set in the first place. It's not fair of me, okay? Um, and then finally, the third thing is leadership development. In order to lead, you have to lead yourself first. Um, and I've got so many examples of this. Like your team isn't producing, cool. Put down the put down the business owner hat for, for three days. Go sell a whole bunch of insurance. Make the biggest paycheck of the whole week in, in front of everybody's face. Um, I'm telling you, it gets everybody rolling. So our, our big event next month, it's 2,500 bucks a person, 50 people this year. And, um, and we sold it out. And I was really stressing about it because my team was lacking a little bit. They weren't taking it serious. At the end of the day, like it, there's a fixed expense to this. It's 2,500 bucks a person. So 125,000 sold out. My cost on this um, event is 243,000. It's a loss leader. Like we hope it leads to something else but it's a loss leader. So I'm out of pocket a quarter of a million dollars. And only if it sells out, I get to recoup half of that. Right. So, um, this was like three weeks ago. We were only halfway sold out. We, we launched registration in January and three weeks ago, we were only halfway sold out. And so finally I was like, okay, hey, fuck it. You know, I provided the carrot, I provided the stick, everything else is here, but I need to lead from the front. And in order to do that, I've got to be in the frame of mind. I need to know which tools to rely on in myself. Everything from setting apart the time in my day to making the commitment, holding myself accountable, all these things um, and going in and working. And I got in, started busting hump and we started seeing some movement, started seeing some sales. But then all of a sudden my team got in and in three weeks we sold this thing out um, again, zero dollars spent in ads, zero. Um, but that movement didn't start until I jumped in and, and started pushing and we can look at that, whether it's policy sales or whether it's CSR service, like leadership always starts with self. How the hell can you expect your CSR to service the client appropriately if you can't and you failed to build the SOPs, the standard operating procedures around that? Mm -hmm. You can't teach it. They, they're they going to struggle to do it. So that's uh, step three. And then step four, real quick, I don't want to take your whole day. It, once you've done all this, now it's time to get into super advanced market split dollar cash balance. Or if you're on the property casualty side, your big commercial, so $5 million commercial, it's time to focus on this. Not in lieu of all these other things, but now you built a machine that's already doing all the little stuff all on its own accord. Now you get to go chase the big stuff. So now mm -hmm. we get to focus on advanced markets. We get to start investing in other things. Believe it or not, you should not invest all your money back into your agency once you're making a certain amount, right? Once you're making seven figures, even high high six figures, 750 plus thousand, a pretty good portion should start going into other things. And before that, you should even be putting a good portion into your Roth IRA and, and other things. But now it's time to start buying appreciating assets and incomes at a discount, really investing, not just putting money in, in retirement accounts, right? Mm -hmm. This is things like buying other businesses, buying real estate, buying, uh, participating in private placements. And that's how real wealth is made. That's how you go from making a million dollars to 10, 20, $30 million. Go ask anybody who's made all that money. They did not make it selling insurance. They made the first, anybody selling insurance who's worth that kind of money, they made the first portion selling insurance. Mm -hmm. Then they use that money to leverage themselves into buying appreciating assets and incomes at a discount and cash flowing or transacting them, right? Yeah, that there was actually a conversation just in one of our, our captive groups that we that I run that around, um, you know, people were saying like, well, what kind of other businesses are, you know, who has side hustles, their insurance agency, all this stuff. And there was some agents in there who were kind of new and they're saying, oh, all these, you know, big successful agents have other businesses. That's how they're successful. And it's like, no, 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 no. You, you start where you start learning the business and insurance, right? I actually think that if you wanted to just start a business from scratch, like you mentioned, you had like, you know, um, auto body shops and garages and things like that. Getting a business up and running from scratch um, outside of insurance is, I believe, much more difficult than the insurance space because you have the product. It's everyone pretty much needs the product, right? You have you have a business model to operate around from day one. But what it does is it takes people who are not really self-employed individuals or producers 
people that are entrepreneurs take those skills and go, oh my gosh, I can transfer this into other things. I can do these other things. I want to invest in other businesses. So the business owners are, you know, that are truly business owners who also have an insurance agency. There's a difference between the people that should be selling insurance every day and the people who should be running a business. And they look for those other businesses to purchase other assets. And yes, they are diversified well, but that is because of the type of individual that they are and the goals that they have. That's exactly Um, it. Like at this level, that's something we start teaching people to do. And again, a lot of this comes from my own experience and what I do, but also my network, my Rolodex, um, because uh, like I've been very fortunate to to meet a lot of really big people, really big players. I've got billionaires as clients. And and the idea at this level is let's start getting you plugged into the network, the connections, the mind frame, like a, a good example of outside investing, um, not stocks, not bonds, not mutual funds. I like investing in in something that's collateralized, right? So I do a lot of private placements, which I really enjoy. Some people hate private placements. I love them. One of my favorite pieces to do right now actually is to go build network with big companies that offer franchises, um, companies in like uh, the dessert sector or the food sector or whatever, and build a relationship to where I can go and buy a franchise at a 20, uh, what I'm looking for is 20 to 25% discount. Because if I can buy a franchise at 20 to 25% discount and they'll let me set up a store with half a million bucks, um, now I only have to set it or or put in, say, 400,000 for that same store, right? And I can set up that store as a franchisee. They're providing everything I need. I don't even have to do it. I can pay somebody on on a contract piece to get the store set up, everything, launch it, run it for 30 days so we have a P&L. That's all I need is 30 days to have a P&L. And now I can sell it, but I can sell this turnkey business not, not just a, a new franchise opportunity, a turnkey business, I can sell that at fair market value. And I can even sell it at a discount because now it has a, a profit and loss attached. I can get more than 100% of the value of the franchise because I can sell the, the P&L as well, right? Um, it's not going to be much because it's only a 30-day track record, but still leverage. So me selling it at just market value of the actual franchise, that's still a discounted price. And I can make that transaction happen very quickly. Well, if I do that on say half a million dollars, my total turnaround time might be like 90 days, maybe four months. And I can pick up 20%. Remember, I bought it at a discount and I'm selling it at market value. I've got short-term capital gain that applies that I can either roll into the next one or pay the tax on and and own it outright. Let's say I pay 30% in tax. Okay, well, now I just made $70,000 over 90 days on my placement of of 400,000, right? That's it. Absolutely incredible um, when it comes to that. And if I can do it in 90 days, I can do that four times a year mm. on that same $400,000. Now, instead of looking at a 15% return, now I'm looking at north of 30% per, per year return or 40% per year return annually on that same $400,000 um, uh, net of tax, which is really cool because I've already paid the tax off now. And um, And the coolest part about all of it my money was at, never at risk in a marketplace. It was always collateralized by at least more than I had in it. At least 25 cents on the dollar. I, I had collateral the whole time. If I couldn't sell it, I could keep it, run it, op- operate it, cash flow it, right? But how cool is that? People don't even know to do that, but you're right. Like if you don't have a half a million dollars, you're willing to throw away at something right now. You can't do that. You can make your half a million dollars through insurance by going through those three steps previously. Yeah. And, and a whole bunch more. So uh, I bet you guys didn't think we were going to start talking about how to uh, how to collateralize and sell and flip uh, franchises when you signed on to this uh, insurance right? <laughs> video, right? But, but, this but that's amazing that that's included, right? Yeah. So it's not even just about getting your agency up and running. It's really teaching like the business model and then how to expand upon that as an entrepreneur and what else to look into. Yeah. It's, it's the life cycle amazing. of an insurance agent. The final thing we do there is divesting. Eventually you're going to exit your agency. You're going to die, mm-hmm. sell it. Um, you're going to succeed that down to children or something like that. In any event, in order to do that um, effectively, you need uh, quality exit levers. So buying a, an agency, for example, you know, a big lever uh, or a, a base lever on, on an agency for a PNC agency right now is like 1.5 times annual revenue. And there's other um, models like EBITDA and whatever for valuation. But if we go on, on revenue, it's like 1.5 times is the base. And then if you're growing, if you're profitable, you have this many mm-hmm. accounts, whatever, you can get up to like 3.5 is pretty top end, right? My last agency, I sold at 6.75. 
And we sold it at 6.75 because we built in all these additional divesting exit levers. Um, and rather than somebody coming in and buying a book of business, they came in and bought a business that contained a book of business. They bought the balance sheet. The balance sheet contained CRM system softwares, marketing plans and strategies, employees already plugged into those and turning. Like it was a turnkey business. That's why it was worth 6.5. So for the same work that I would have put in to sell something at 3.5, I got 6.75 out of it. So I got two pennies, or, or I'm sorry, $2 on the dollar for every, like that's that's why, and, and it sounds cocky and haughty, but People are like, how did you accelerate to, to this point um, in your first 10 years? And, and you know, we did we hit our first million per year inside of our first five years. How did you accelerate? And it's always been because um, I haven't been afraid to put my money where my mouth is and try new things. And like we were talking about earlier, if I didn't know or I wasn't sure, not just go do the homework. I'll do that too, but go pay someone to teach me. Like mm -hmm. I currently pay a hundred, I think this year I'll be close to 130,000 on my own coaches and mentors. I'm not afraid to spend the money. It didn't start like that back then. Back then it started self-study for free. And then, well, Hey, let me join this private little mastermind for $20 a month that, mm -hmm. or, or buy this newsletter. And in fact, that was probably one of the first things I did was I started paying for Van Mueller's newsletters, which is like $14 a month. And you got something every month, but Van Mueller, if you know him, dude's amazing. He's got great conversations and strategies. And I just wanted that consistent flow. It was mm -hmm. like such a small investment to make. The first technology investment I made into myself was Calendly. Actually, I started with schedule once. Um, mm. I haven't seen that one. I started right with Calendly. So yeah, I, <laughs> I, I started with schedule later. once and I liked it. I think it's a little more robust and a little more integratable. Um, but Calendly is way more user-friendly. I've switched to Calendly, but it was like 14 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. like you don't have to make huge investments. You just got to start somewhere. So anyways, I'll hush. No, I, I would agree with that. The first thing that I did was uh, purchase a marketing program that I just knew an agent who had success with it, kind of vetted it through him and, and spent the money on that. And even that was a couple thousand dollars. But when I got that, you know, this was four, almost five years, four years ago. I, first time I ever bought one, I thought I knew, you know, I could do it myself for the first five years as an agent and spend the money on that. And it just kind of opened my mind to the entire concept of speeding up my knowledge, right? Speed it up, take a shortcut, learn from others who've already made the mistakes and, and done all the things that they um, have ironed out what works, what doesn't work. And um, yeah, after that, I've just, just been buying all sorts of things. People, when I was at Accelerate, they were asking about, you know, what kind of tech stack, how much you spend on technology. And I'm like, I, I don't know, <laughs> it's probably too much, but I, and I know I definitely have spent money on technology where I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. And then I get into the nitty gritty and I'm like, nope, never mind. And I just, you know, shift to something else. But at the end of the day, if you're not testing, you're not trying and you're not innovating, other people are just, they're going to surpass you, right? It's going to be easier to do business with the agent across the street and that's where they're going to go. And if you know anything about, you know, millennials and everybody younger than that, we really like things easy. We do not like things that are difficult. And um, yeah, anyways, well, I didn't actually know that you guys in that fourth stage, I don't think we've ever talked about the fourth stage. So I didn't know that you guys did all that. That's amazing. Um, I appreciate your time so much and sharing this. Um, if people want to reach you, how should they reach you? How do they get in contact with you? Yeah, best place to find, like it sounds so cheesy. I wasn't even on Facebook three years ago, but um, find me on Facebook at C Porter 389. Um, I just spend a ton of time on there anymore because that's where we host a lot of our, our community stuff. So I'm there anyways, but find me there. Um, you can always find our stuff, revagencysyndicate.com. Um, but I would also urge everybody, like one of the reasons I like you, Mariah, and this is, so everybody knows this is not solicited. Uh, Mariah did not ask me to say anything about this, but one of the reasons uh, I really appreciate what Mariah is doing is she understands, like we talked about how that value that you have, all those sales skills, all those scripts, all that, if you can't clearly communicate that in an effective, efficient manner, it's wasted in vanity. That's literally what, what Mariah and, and her team do. And I appreciate it so much. I wish I had somebody teaching me this early on. Yeah, I've been able to compress my timeline and, and have a really great first 10 years in business. Um, but do you know how much money I've spent on this, figuring it out for myself because I didn't have somebody in the beginning and I was too stubborn to, to have somebody. I started making 
Um, the first year I broke a uh, quarter million dollars was my second year in business, broke a half a million, my third year in business. I never had a penny to show for being in business um, until the last couple of years. I spent every single dime of it on trial and error um, until finally I started spending it on coaches and, and all this other stuff. And they helped show me how to, how to find some margin. And Mariah, I know you and your team do provide a ton of support for free even on, on how to implement some of this stuff. So I just, I think the world that you and, um, and what you're doing, it's the right thing. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, thanks. I don't know what I would say. Smile. <laughs> well, I appreciate everything. Yeah, I appreciate everything that you've been doing. I, we actually got connected kind of like in a weird way, um, through another party and I'm grateful for that. So, um, appreciate the, you know, relationship and continue to grow that. And um, for anyone watching, yeah, I, I encourage you to reach out to Carson, especially if you just, you're just not sure where to start, right? That That's a big, big question. We get a lot too. We talk to agents like, I think this is what I need, but I, I agree that we hear a lot of um, people just don't understand where their issue is and how to, how to um, clearly attack that with a plan that's, um, thought out. And there's, there's another marketing or there's another group I'm part of as well. And that's probably my favorite part of it is that I can say, Hey, I need, um, I need to hire. What is that process? Right. Bam. There's the process sitting down and figuring that process out and researching and learning the time that it takes you, the money that you lose over that time. Um, that's what you should be thinking about when you're talking about whether you should be in a group or a coach, whatever you're looking to hire for, um, creating your own, um, plan is how much money are you losing with the time that it takes you? to have to do it yourself. That's what was the biggest realization for me. How much money could I have been making? And then when you start making that money, you're like, dang, you kind of kick yourself for it. You wish you would have done it sooner. So um, if Carson seems like the right fit for you, reach out to him. You will not regret it. Thank you so much, Carson, Carson, for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me.